heart of our nation's capital. Here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks for joining us as we take you beyond the headlines to hear directly from our nation's leaders and newsmakers as we pursue the truth on the issues that matter most to you and your family, all from a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Tony Perkins, and Washington Watch starts now. Ireland, Norway, and Spain have decided to reward the terrorists of Hamas with the prize of recognizing a Palestinian state. Ireland, Norway, and Spain are telling Hamas in a loud and clear voice that the October 7th massacre pays off. That was Israeli government spokesman David Mincer responding to the announcement by Spain, Ireland, and Norway, saying they would recognize a Palestinian state. Israel has responded by withdrawing their diplomats from those countries. We'll get more on Israel's response from Ohad Tal, a member of the Israeli Knesset, in just a moment. And is the recognition of a Palestinian state a precursor to the advancement of the so-called two-state solution? Each country is entitled to make its own determinations, but the U.S. position on this is clear. President Biden, as I just said, has been on the record supporting a two-state solution. He has been equally emphatic on the record that that two-state solution should be brought about through direct negotiations through the parties, not through unilateral recognition. That was National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan, Jake Sullivan today. We'll, uh, we'll examine the implications of this uh, international push. And in response to the International Criminal Court issuing arrest warrants for uh, members of the Israeli cabinet, including the prime minister. House Speaker Mike Johnson says it's time the U.S. puts the rogue court in its place. We're not going to allow them to use warfare to undermine state sovereignty or usurp the authority of democratic nations. America should punish the ICC and put Kareem Khan back in his place. And if the ICC is allowed to threaten Israel's leaders, we know that America will be next. We'll talk with Wisconsin Congressman Glenn Grothman a little bit later here on Washington Watch. The website, TonyPerkins.com, lots of resources there for you today, so be sure and check it out. Again, that's TonyPerkins.com. Well, earlier today, as I mentioned, the countries of Spain, Norway, and Ireland announced that they would recognize Palestine as an independent state, a decision representing a rebuke to Israel as it fights for its existence. And it also signals that they want to reward Hamas for its terrorist attack. Though more than 150 countries recognize a Palestinian state out of the United Nations, most Western European democracies and the United States do not. Along with recognizing a Palestinian state, representatives for Spain, Norway, and Ireland all expressed desire for what they call a two-state solution, an outcome that Hamas uh, proved the futility of on October the 7th. Joining me now to discuss this is M.K. Ohad Tal, a member of the Israeli Knesset for the Religious Zionist Party. Uh, M.K. Tal, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to see you. Thank you very much, Tony, for having me. Let me first get your thoughts on the announcement from these, Euro these three European nations today. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, it's such an hypocrisy and it's, it's outrageous because what is actually the meaning of recognizing a Palestinian state? It means that we want to give a reward to those who came and butchered our families, raped our women, beheaded our little children. We want to reward them. Again, I want to remind everybody that Israel has withdrawn from the Gaza Strip in 2005 and gave it to the Palestinians. So effectively, there was already a Palestinian state for 20 years. What have we got for that? Only terror and missiles in our cities. So now we want to take this brilliant success and expand it to the whole area of Judea and Samaria, just a few kilometers from Tel Aviv, from Jerusalem, from Ben Gurion Airport. I mean, really, I think, uh, you know, only today, a video was released from October 7th of our of the of the this terrorist of Hamas penetrating our villages and our base uh, army bases, taking kidnapping young girls, soldiers from one of the bases, uh, 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 shouting on them, beating them in a, in a horrible horrible way, and these are, these are the people that now no way in Ireland and Spain, this is, these, are, these are the people that we're going to recognize and give them a state as a reward. It's absolutely craziness. 
So, so let me ask you this, because this is actually the area you represent uh, in the Knesset, is it not? Excuse me again? Th this, is the, this is the area you come from that they're talking about when we talk about this two-state solution that would be the— I mean, if you're recognizing a Palestinian state, they have to have land. Um, and that land right. that's being advocated is Samaria and Judea, which is a, a portion of what you represent. Exactly, exactly right. As I said, they want to expand this brilliant success that we had in Gaza. They want to now expand it to Judea and Samaria, to more places, to the whole, basically, the, the cradle of the Jewish uh, uh, people existence. They want to take that and give it to the Palestinians in order to have another terror state at the heartland of the Jewish people. I, I, I want to pull up a map for those watching. Uh, I, I want to pull up this map of, of Israel. Uh, go ahead and pull up this, uh, this map, and you'll see the, the West Bank, which is so-called so West Bank. That's Judea and Samaria. That's actually uh, a portion of the area that uh, M.K. Tal represents. That's what they want to give away as a part of the two-state solution. That's the heart of, of Israel. Now, I, I, I have a second map that I want to show you um, that you can see the con in context of the United States. All right, you see that little strip in the middle. That's the size of Israel compared to the United States. So we're talking about taking out the heart of that little strip of land, creating a, 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 a Palestinian state. And as we've seen since 2007, when Hamas was given control of Gaza, what they do. So, I mean, this, this is not really difficult to figure out what would be the outcome, is it? You're right. It's craziness from all, all, way, all perspectives. It's crazy because that will pose an existential threat to the very existence of the state of Israel, to have another terror state in in our heartland, but it's also it's a, it's a, it's a craziness because of, of of theological aspect because that's to take the holiest sites like Hebron and Shiloh and Bethlehem and and, Jer and East Jerusalem and give it to the Palestinians, take it away from the people of Israel to take the land of Israel from the people of Israel and to give it to the Palestinians. Does anybody really believe that that will bring more stability and prosperity to anybody? Well, th that's what these European countries are arguing, saying that a two-state solution is essential for lasting peace in the region. Can, can you see under any scenario where history, that would be the case? History has proven, and October 7th proved it beyond any doubt that every time that Israel has given away parts of the land to the Arabs, we, all, we haven't got any peace, we haven't got any prosperity, we, ha we haven't got any stability, we only got death and bloodshed from that. And if those people and uh, those countries want to, to take this brilliant success and to expand it to Judea and Samaria, I can tell you one thing. We will not allow that. We will not accept that. It will, it's not going to happen. So l let me ask you this, uh, M.K. Tal. Is this, uh, this international, these international decisions, is this to create more pressure upon Israel to get them to back off of going into uh, finishing off the job in Rafah when it comes to Hamas? I mean, what, what, what's the bigger picture here that, that Israel interprets these moves to mean? You know, I think that uh, we see today the rise of anti-Semitism in so many places in the world. I believe this is part of the same, the same conceptions and the same ideology. They want to see Israel weak. They want to see Israel getting bitten by our neighbors here in the Middle East. And um, again, this is this is a conception which which we will not accept. I mean, the Jewish people has suffered for two thousand years of persecutions and anti-Semitism, uh, we will not allow uh, these countries to dictate the future of the Jewish people. We will fight, we will protect ourselves, and if we'll have to do it all by ourselves, so we will do it all by ourselves. Uh, my guest is a member of the Israeli Knesset, uh, Ohad Tal. Is there a growing sense in Israel among the leaders and the people that increasingly you're standing alone? 
I think that after what we've seen in the last in the past seven months um, from our closest ally from America, I mean, of course, I mean, the current administration in America uh, is very concerning because I, give, I can give you several examples. I mean, the first thing President Biden is doing after the unprecedented attack of Iran against Israel with over 300 ballistic missiles is to call Prime Minister Netanyahu and to tell him that America will not back Israel uh, 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 responding to this brutal attack, this is not something you would expect to see from a close ally, knowing that we are fighting for our existence. Uh, there's, there are so many more examples. Even just the fact that they're trying to push us away from going to Rafah and eradicating Hamas. What is the meaning of that? I mean, Hamas is now holding about 130 hostages. They are still in their hands. So we're not allowed to bring them back. We're not allowed to protect ourselves. We are not allowed to make sure that Hamas is eradicated, that they will not be able to commit another uh, a, a brutal, another a massacre to our people. This is what it means. So this is not something you would expect to see from our allies. And if our allies do not understand that, yes, so we are concerned. And as I said, we will have to do whatever we need to do in order to protect our people with or without our friends in the world. Where are you finding support? You know, I actually now visiting here in America. Uh, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm in a, a huge uh, conference of supporting Israel. I see here so many people who are who love Israel, who support Israel. You know, uh, I, 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 I know that the vast majority of Americans, 80 percent, and we see that in every poll, support Israel. The same 20 percent who are not supporting Israel are the same 20 percent who support Bin Laden. Uh, so, you know, I very much in favor. I, 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 I'm happy with the 80 percent. And I am sure that we will see changes. I hope and I pray to God that we will also see changes in the, administration, the American administration and the way they treat Israel. Well, uh, I know that you know that among evangelical Bible-believing Christians that we stand with Israel, the right of Israel to defend itself. Uh, we pray for and uh, we stand with Israel and the Jewish people against this rise of anti-Semitism that you made reference to. Uh, Ohad, always great to uh, talk with you. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much for your prayers. We feel that. We're uh, we appreciate that a lot. Thank you very much for being with us. Absolutely. Member of the Israeli Knesset, Ohad Tal, um, actually in Nashville for a conference uh, among supporters of Israel. All right. Uh, as we have been following the, the aid, the support to, to Israel, if you'd like to lean in on that, let your voice be heard, text AID to 67742. That's A-I-D to 67742 to make sure what Congress allocated to support our ally Israel actually ends up there because the Biden administration, again, playing games on that. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about this uh, announcement, these arrest warrants from the International Criminal Court. A joke? Uh, how's America going to respond? How's Congress going to respond? What will Republicans do? Uh, we heard earlier House Speaker Mike Johnson making reference to that. Well, when we come back, uh, we're going to be talking to Glenn Grothman from Wisconsin about likely action that the House will take as it pertains to the International Criminal Court. All right, don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. It begins here and here and here every day. Before you stand, you need solid ground. Standing in a culture that wants you to surrender the truth won't work unless you have a firm foundation. At Family Research Council, we have that firm foundation and you can find us standing. We stand for the value of all human life. We stand for the right of families to flourish. And every day we stand for your freedom to believe and to live out those beliefs both at home and abroad. We work with government officials, educating them on the issues from a biblical worldview. And when necessary, we hold them accountable. We equip Christians across America to be informed and to take action in their communities. 
With our daily radio program, television appearances, and vast online presence, we reach people where they are. We envision an America where all human life is valued, families flourish, and religious liberty thrives. And that won't be realized if we're not standing. Stand for faith. Stand for family. Stand for freedom. Stand with us at FRC. All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday. It's good to be back behind the microphone. My appreciation to Jody Heiss for filling in for me while I was traveling. I'll talk a little bit about that later. I was at a Lincoln Day dinner last night in uh, Muskegon, Michigan, where we've got actually a number of listeners. I'm uh, I may talk about that more. But for now, this week's announcement that the International Criminal Court had issued arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Defense Minister Gallant brought renewed calls from Republicans in Congress to impose sanctions on the court. Uh, this is what House Speaker Mike Johnson had to say earlier today. America should punish the ICC and put Kareem Khan back in his place. And if the ICC is allowed to threaten Israel's leaders, we know that America will be next. There is a reason that we've never endorsed the International Criminal Court, because it is a direct affront to our own sovereignty. Though President Biden expressed criticism of the ICC's actions, his administration had previously reversed Trump-era sanctions against the ICC if the court targeted the United States or Israel. Now, what form could these sanctions take? Join me now to discuss this by phone, Congressman Glenn Grothman. He serves on the House Committee on Education and Workforce, the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, as well as the House Budget Committee. He represents the 6th Congressional District of Wisconsin. Congressman, welcome back to uh, the program. Well, glad to be on the show, as always. And we just, well, we'll, we'll begin to talk a little bit about one more example why you should never, ever want the United States to be part of these big international agencies. It, it, it doesn't work out for, for our republic or for our friends, uh, democratic uh, governments like Israel. So there is a growing fear on Capitol Hill regarding this and a recognition that the U.S. should place sanctions on the ICC. What form might those sanctions take? Well, I think somehow, I think that's being discussed, but we've got to do something to make sure that this organization doesn't feel in the future they can crack down, quite frankly, on anybody anywhere for any reason whatsoever. I mean, you couldn't have a country more innocent uh, of doing anything wrong than Israel in this, right? You've got a country that is attacked, over a thousand of its citizens are killed, and what they do is they, they say that we have to arrest Benjamin Netanyahu, in, in essence, if he leaves Israel and goes almost anywhere in the world other than 
the U.S. or Israel. So this, I mean, they, they issued arrest warrants for Hamas officials as well. But, of course, Hamas is a terrorist organization that attacked Israel, oh, as you right. pointed out, on October the 7th. So this appears like it's more politically driven in terms of their overall agenda, as uh, I just had a member of the Knesset on the program earlier, Ohad Tal, talking about the rising sense of anti-Semitism that has led to, you know, we had three countries, uh, European countries today, uh, recognize a Palestinian state. Uh, can Israel get a fair shake in these international courts? Of course not. Of course not. Because it represents the West. And they hate the West. Just as the United States, if they give a chance, is never going to get a fair shake on this stuff. Right? So we know, it, 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 Congressman Grossman, Grossman, we know that the ICC has no authority over the United States, over Israel. They don't recognize them. But what are the real dangers here? Well, the danger is they could eventually try to arrest someone when they're in some other country. Uh, they certainly have sent the message to the world and sent the message to the Arab world that Benjamin Netanyahu should be an outlier and should become a pariah. They have pounded it in to everybody around the world that Israel is morally repugnant. And believe it or not, morally repugnant at a time when just a few months ago, a thousand of its citizens were killed. So, so, it's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? It, it, it is, uh, when they're simply defending themselves and still uh, trying to get back their citizens that were taken hostage on October the 7th. Do you see this as fanning the flames of the anti-Semitism that we've seen around the globe? Well, you got to wonder, what is the motive for singling him out? It could be one of two motives. It could be pure rank anti-Semitism. That's possible. It could be pure anti-Westernism, mm -hmm. right? You have a country that's hated because it's adjacent or adjacent to Gaza, really, and they are a successful, honestly run nation. And let's face it, most of the members of the ICC, just as most of the members of the United Nations, are morally bankrupt, crooked countries, right? And then that, even though it's not a country, that fills the bill with Gaza, right? You've got a country that uh, is completely corrupt. The, they take money that the Europeans and other people send to them, and the leadership runs off and lives lavish lifestyle in Turkey, lavish lifestyle in, in, in Qatar, right? And, uh, and Israel is just wildly successful. I've been to Israel. You look at the countries around Israel, and they are— or basket cases, as most corrupt nations are. Right. right. And Israel is successful, not to mention uh, Israel is based on a religion, right, uh, founded to protect Jews. And I think around the globe you have a growing number of what else to call them, anti-God countries that probably is offended by Israel's I, I think that's the right yeah, way to put it. Well. I think that because I think that's at what's at the heart of anti-Semitism is the same thing we see. Many of these same places uh, attack Christians as well. It is uh, it is a hostility toward God. Very quickly, uh, Congressman Grothman, uh, when might we see Congress take action, uh, at least in the House, against the ICC? Well, that yeah, that'll be up to Mike Johnson. My would my guess would be. We're, we're going to be out of Washington next week, but my guess would be in two weeks, I would be disappointed if Mike Johnson doesn't have something put together for the floor by that time. And one more time, just as with the United Nations, it's kind of left to the United States to provide some moral guidance for the rest of the world. Right. And, you know, you have so many, I'm looking at the other countries, members of the ICC, countries like, sadly, Canada, but also a lot of... Um, military dictatorships, corrupt dictatorships right. who are on board here, and they should be standing up to this, but they're not standing up to it. Right. Congressman uh, Grothman, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Right. And, and I do want to point out, it should be an object lesson for your listeners. Yeah. Whether you're talking about the ICC, whether you're talking about the WHO, whether you're talking about the United Nations, 
These big international organizations are all bad. Are big time trouble. We've got, we got to leave it there. Right. Folks, don't go away. We're back with more after the break. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us while we uh, we're squeezing every second out of that last segment. By the way, we're going to in the next uh, break in the in the D block, rather, we're going to be talking with uh, Dr. A.J. Nolte. We're going to continue our conversation about uh, Israel and what's unfolding there with this call for a Palestinian state. But uh, in domestic news, Oklahoma state laws allow for students to be released from schools during school hours in order to receive religious instruction. Now, this, this actually happens in about 26 states across the country. It's been happening since, uh, well, probably about three decades. Well, in an effort to clear up any confusion regarding the Oklahoma's religious release program law, this week, the Oklahoma State Legislature is considering House Bill 1425, which provides a guide for school districts on how to implement such programs. Joining me now to discuss this is Oklahoma State Representative Clay Stairs. He's the sponsor of the House Bill, uh, House Bill 1425. He represents Oklahoma's 66th district. Uh, Representative, welcome to Washington Watch. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me uh, on the show today. I appreciate it. Now, th this should not be controversial. I mean, it's been around for decades. In fact, California is one state that's really championed this and been using it for probably 25, 30 years. Uh, but it's run into a little bit of difficulty in Oklahoma. Tell us about it. Yeah, we have. Uh, and I think the, the primary uh, resistance there is coming strictly out of just not fully understanding what the bill does. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of people, most most of the conversations that, that uh, I am having with people that are uh, resisting it start out with, Clay, do you really think we should allow uh, students to be leaving school for religious education? And uh, and that right there, the very first sentence is mm, that's a misunderstanding there. We already our state statutes already allow students to leave school for excused absences for religious education. But the problem is, is that there there aren't any instructions or guidelines or guide rails, guardrails to to show how to do that. And so if we're not careful, we can have schools that run afoul of uh, establishment laws. And uh, so, as you mentioned, all the way back in 1952, there was a Supreme Court uh, ruling that ruled that this is constitutional, number one, and it gave instructions on how to do it. 
So what House Bill 1425 does here in Oklahoma is it uh, it simply takes the instructions from the federal Supreme Court decision and it puts that language into Oklahoma state statute. So Representative so, Stairs, so we're able to. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just so so our listeners uh, understand very clearly what this is. It allows outside organizations, uh, and I think your guidance sets the standards for what those groups would be and what they could do. But the students can be released from school for, I think it's an hour, three times a week, up to three times a week, to go uh, off-site. It's not on school property. Uh, no school uh, uh, teachers or facility or facilitators are there. This is all uh, outside nonprofit, and allows them to go with parental permission F with, for religious instruction, correct? Yes, and, and once again, they are already allowed to do it. What this bill does is it gives them instructions on how to implement that Oklahoma statute. And, and again, that's where a lot of the misunderstanding comes from and the resistance. And uh, so, uh, again, thank you for having me on the show today so we can talk a little bit about this. What? Because what this bill does is it gives the instructions on how to implement this state statute. So what happens without those instructions? Oh, great question. Yeah. Without these instructions, a, a school can easily, and there have been schools that have here in Oklahoma, a school can try to implement uh, it, releasing children for releasing students for uh, religious or moral education. But if you're not careful, we there's one school that did it, but they did it inside the school and they used a, a, a teacher, a public school teacher to do the instruction. And that you can't do. Now you're going to run into some establishment law problems and get a lawsuit. So you're just you're you're trying to help the schools out that want to do this and do it in such a way that they're in conformity with the law. Again, this has been around. This goes back to 1952 to the U.S. Supreme Court, right. uh, and it's been used successfully. I've, I've visited some of the programs, uh, in particular in California, uh, that work mm -hmm. uh, quite well. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I commend you for your interest in this and your effort in trying to, number one, clear it up, but also I think bringing clarity to it also promotes it. Uh, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. And, and that is our hope. And uh, I, I want to protect our parents and their uh, First Amendment rights and their parents' rights to uh, in, when it comes to the education of their kids. But I also want to make sure we protect our public schools from uh, by giving them guidelines so they don't get sued. Right. So I think this is a, a wonderful bill for uh, schools. It's a wonderful bill for parents. It's a wonderful bill for Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would not expect any difficulty in the uh, red state of Oklahoma. What part, uh, very quickly, what part of Oklahoma do you represent? I represent District 66, which is just outside of Tulsa uh, in Sand Springs, Skytook, and Sperry, just yes. to the west of Tulsa, well, northeast I, Oklahoma. I graduated from high school in Cleveland, Oklahoma. So hey, there we go. The Skytook, Oklahoma. You yeah. know right where I'm living. Yeah. yeah. They have played, played them in football That's in high school. So. There we go. Oh, yeah. Man, don't get me started on that. Yeah. All right. Well, great to talk <laughs> with you, uh, Representative Stairs. Thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Good things come out of Oklahoma. All right. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation on Israel, the recognition of a Palestinian state and what that might lead to. That's coming up next as Dr. A.J. Nolte joins me here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. Between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, 
FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give. Jesus said in John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in Him through His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in Him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible and join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash S-A-G-E-C-O-N, sage con, to learn more. That's S-A-G-E-C-O-N, sage con, to learn more. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. All right, uh, before we get into our discussion in just a moment with Dr. A.J. Nolte on uh, following up on this uh, recognition by three European countries of a Palestinian state and this push for two-state solution, you might find it helpful to actually get the maps that I made reference to earlier. And we've got them available for you. I know not everyone's watching, some are listening. But if you text MAPS, M-A-P-S, MAPS, plural, to 67742, you'll get a link and you can actually see the two maps that I made reference to earlier. Uh, pictures, a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, and we're going to discuss that in just a moment. So you might want to go ahead and, uh, and get that again. Text MAPS, M-A-P-S, to 67742. Our word for today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now it had happened when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me only have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have with the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. We see a contrast in this passage between David and Saul. David served selflessly and prospered as the result by God, which Saul benefited from, actually, but he was consumed. Saul was consumed by the destructive forces of pride and jealousy and wanted to take David down. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, text Bible to 67742. Uh, by the way, I mentioned last night I was in uh, Muskegon, Ohio, uh, Michigan rather, uh, for a Lincoln Day dinner. And we have one of our AFR stations there. And so we uh, had a great time visiting with some of our many listeners there in Muskegon. And, and by the way, I'm going to share those remarks because they're quite, I think, timely. We talk about how the Republican Party, the conservative party, must not abandon its commitment to life. And I'm going to actually share that with you this coming Monday. Uh, so you might want to tune in for that. And uh, by the way, 
For those in the Baton Rouge area, next week, Dr. Ben Carson is going to be at our Baton Rouge facility at our Faith and Freedom Chapel. An evening with Dr. Ben Carson. That is Thursday, May the 30th at 7 o'clock p.m. To find out more, go to TonyPerkins.com or visit FRC.org slash Carson. All right, joining me now to, uh, to talk more about the issue of Israel and this call for a two-state solution, Dr. A.J. Nolte, Assistant Professor at Regent University, uh, Robertson School of Government, and the Director of the Institute for Israel's, Israel Studies. Uh, Dr. Nolte, welcome back to Washington Watch. Tony, it's always good to be here. Um, and as always, I feel like I'm saying I wish we were here on better circumstances, but uh, that's that's where we are, but it's, it's good to be back. Well, it seems as if uh, things continue to spiral downward as it, uh, are, I guess you could say down, depending on your perspective. But uh, now three countries uh, coming out today, uh, European countries, which is different Western countries, uh, recognizing, uh, calling for recognition of a Palestinian state. So if you're going to recognize a Palestinian state, they have to have land. Um, and that would be falling right in line with this so-called proposed two-state solution, correct? Yeah, so there's a couple of things to unpack here. First of all, our State Department has been talking about the idea of a provisional recognition of, of a Palestinian state in the sense that, you know, at the end of the process, there will be created a Palestinian state. And they've been adamant that they want uh, to to ask the Israelis to make sure that nothing in Gaza precludes the creation of a Palestinian state in the future. Um, and so there's been a talk of, uh, of an idea that they're going to recognize sort of the idea of a Palestinian state and recognize a Palestinian state in being. Um, the problem with this is several fold. One, from the Israeli perspective, it's a very simple, clear-cut issue. You have the attack on October 7th, and the Israelis, I think, with a lot of justification, say, it would be sending a terrible message and would be detrimental to their security to reward the October 7th attacks with a recognition of a Palestinian state. All right, so that, that's issue one. Issue one is rewarding terroristic behavior. Yes. It, um, and that, and, and where, where's, how is it that the international community, Ireland um, and others, are missing that? I mean, how is that, how are they not seeing the connection between calling for recognition of a Palestinian state and the terrorist attack invasion that took place on October the 7th. How are they missing that? Well, I think what they are trying to do is walk a line without openly condemning some of the stuff that Israel's doing, but also kind of appeasing the left in their own countries often um, and you know the Arab states and saying that there is eventually at some point going to be a Palestinian state. Um, and this actually brings me to the second huge problem, which is to have a Palestinian state, not only do you have to have land, but you have to have a legitimate authority. And as far as we can tell, there really is no legitimate authority in the Palestinian uh, community. There are two political movements, Fatah and Hamas. Hamas is a non-starter, and Fatah is so corrupt that it has actually driven the people under its de facto rule in the West Bank to support Hamas as an alternative. So to have a Palestinian state, you'd have to have actually the possibility of creating one. And just pragmatically, there's no entity that's capable of doing that. So, uh, Dr. Nolte, let's talk about, you know, as we have Norway, Ireland, Spain, there's already 140 other countries that call for recognition of Pal a Palestinian state. But, of course, these are major players. These are Western countries. So that's, that's the big right. difference here. Is this about building momentum for that? What, what is the uh, – how do you see this playing out? I think it probably is. It's, it's probably trying to build momentum uh, for that. But I, I don't necessarily know that that momentum is going to go anywhere. Um, the reality, again, one of the big problems that you have is that the, the Arab states that are surrounding the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in theory, yes, they openly support the idea of the creation of a Palestinian state. But in practice, there's a lot of uncertainty whether Fatah has the capacity, and nobody wants Hamas to end up in charge. Because if you recognize a Palestinian state and then Hamas end, ends up in charge and they attack Israel, then you have a state of war between states. Um, and so it's not, you know, it, right. So it's not the oppressed Palestinian people. It's one state attacking another. 
Right. But, but once you bring about statehood, I mean, we've had Gaza under the governance of Hamas since 2007, right. but they've not had a military per se. I mean, they, they, they've created one, but they haven't had certain things that come with a recognized, declared state. I mean, and so we see what they've done and what they've caused here in the last seven months. If, this, if they were, in fact, a legitimately recognized state with an army, with all of the other uh, aspects of a state, this could have been, I mean, this would be, I'm not quite sure how this would turn out. Well, one of the things to keep in mind, too, Tony, is state recognition gets you some benefits, but it doesn't get you everything. For example, Somalia is a recognized state. Um, it's also a failed state. Somaliland, which is unrecognized in, in that same area, um, is actually kind of in, in better shape in terms of actually having legitimate authority. So does it change the facts on the ground to some extent? The real reason that they want this is because it changes the international dimension and it would make it much more difficult for Israel than it already is in international courts. But it could also bring more money, uh, more armaments, more resources yeah. into uh, to Gaza. But let, let's talk more about what's on the table, because I don't think people realize when we talk about West Bank, Palestinian state, they're not talking about just Gaza. Now, we are talking you know, immediately the governance of Gaza once this conflict is over. But the call for a two-state solution is not just Gaza. It includes the so-called West Bank, which is Samaria and Judea. So, I, again, I want to pull up a map for those who are watching us. Uh, they can see. I want to pull up the map of Israel once again, and you can see uh, the green area on that map. By the way, folks, if you if you can't uh, if you're not watching and you're listening, you can text maps to six seven seven four two. That's maps M A P S to six seven seven four two, and I highly recommend it because this is the eye opener. This is. Uh, like I said, a picture is worth a thousand words. This shows you what this is all about. So, so Dr. Nolte, when we're talking about the so-called West Bank, which is, you know, west of the Jordan River, Samaria, Judea, 80 percent of what we read about in the Bible happened to this area. How can Israel continue to be a country, defend itself, if we take the heart of that land out and turn it into a Palestinian state, given what we've just witnessed occurred in Gaza, which is a fraction of the size of the, uh, the, the so-called West Bank. And that's the kicker, and that's the final point. Tony, the irony, as you're, I'm sure, aware, is that there was a point at which virtually everything that is now being asked of Israel was offered by Ehud Barak to the, uh, Yasser Arafat in the late 1990s. And the Palestinian Authority rejected that, and it started actually the Second Intifada, which we've talked about before, a very violent, terroristic assault on Israel. And since then, support for the Palestinian state has plummeted. Now, if you talk to Israel, even people on the Israeli left are not supportive of the Palestinian state because of what happened on October 7th. Hamas attacked the people in Israel that were the most sympathetic to the creation of a Palestinian state at some point. So, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of commentary from Israelis, and even some of the folks on the left and the center left are saying, look, we would love to have a Palestinian state that we could work with. Show us the Palestinian faction that is actually willing to live in peace with us, and we'll talk. Because you're right. With those boundaries, if you don't have a stable, democratic, entity that is committed to the existence of Israel and to working with them peacefully, it's a complete non-starter. And, and that's what caused it to fall apart before, because they wouldn't recognize the right of Israel to exist. Mm -hmm. but, but Dr. Nolte, if we go back a little bit further, say 100 years, uh, where yep. we saw there was, there was a West Palestine and an East Palestine, there were two big sections of land. Uh, it was recognized that on the East side of Palestine, which Jordan came out of, that was that was a part of the original space that uh, that uh, Britain had control over. Turns it over to the United Nations, but that could have been the the, the area for the Palestinians. But they, the, you, you've got all these surrounding countries that are much larger than Israel, but yet they don't want the Palestinians. 
And there's a reason for that. If you look at what happened to Jordan, Jordan at one point took in a lot of the Palestinian refugees. Um, and then there was an attack on, I, I think it was King Hussein um, at the time. And, and there was an assault that was linked back to some of those Palestinian groups. You know, you look at what happened with Lebanon. So it's been destabilizing for these other countries. Um, and so they're kind of just hoping that eventually a Palestinian state will be created um, by magic and that it will be, or, or that it will just indefinitely remain the Israelis' problem. And I think Israel is probably no longer going to be satisfied with that status quo after October 7th. Well, especially uh, not if the international community is turning against Israel and blaming them for dealing with the rest of the world's problem, because that's essentially what the Palestinian problem is. It is the world's problem created by the United Nations, created by the international community, and they expect Israel to deal with it, but yet they get upset when they do deal with it. I agree with that. Um, and I think one of the places that we need to start is, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a former, I think it was Inspector General at UNRWA, who uh, gave some really damning testimony about things that are happening there and actually argued that UNRWA needs to be eliminated and that we need to start over. And I think if you look at UNRWA, you will see the source of a lot of the problems in the Palestinian uh, society and a lot, you know, between the education, the generational, multi-generational benefits for refugees that we don't extend to any other refugee uh, community in the world. Um, and it creates a situation where you have a toxic combination of, I hate to sound like a conservative on FRC, but welfare dependency uh, over multi multiple generations combined with anti-Semitism and some of this Islamic rhetoric, Islamist rhetoric, and you've got a situation that's going to take generations now to unwind before you can even consider a Palestinian state. So final question for you, Dr. Nolte, we just have a couple of minutes left. But when we look at all of this as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, we can't look at it apart from Scripture and the spiritual dynamics at play here. What do we make of that from—what do we make of this from that perspective? I, you know, I struggle with this to a certain extent, you know, as, as some, a more of a government guy than a, than a theology guy. But I will say this. There is this unreasoning hatred of Israel where— you know, nobody's talking about Morocco and Western Sahara, which has a dispute, which you have a secessionist movement, you know, in Western Sahara that wants to be separate. And I'm not saying that, that Morocco should or shouldn't respond in, in any way that they want. I'm just saying it, it's the same situation, but no one's talking about it because it's not involving the nation state of Israel. And so it does raise this question on a spiritual level. Why is there this constant double standard and this constant hatred toward, antipathy toward the world's only Jewish state? And what does this that say on sort of a spiritual level, particularly in some of these post-Christian countries now uh, in Europe that are, that are increasingly turning against Israel? Uh, and, and to me, that's the main correct question that it raises in my mind. Yeah, and I, and I think it... When you look at all of that and you evaluate the entire world and why this 0.2 percent of the population occupies so much of the world's attention, it would suggest you that there's more than meets the eye uh, with Absolutely. Israel. Uh, Dr. Nolte, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for uh, taking time to join us today. Very much appreciate your insights. Thank you. Well, folks, I think we need to continue to pray for Israel and uh, what is happening there. You can help out, lean in on making sure they get the aid that they were told to get. You can text AID to 67742. Also, once again, I would encourage you to take a look at these maps. I'm just, quite frankly, eye-opening. Maps, M-A-P-S to 67742. All right, all the time we have for today, uh, for today, but uh, Lord willing, we'll be back again tomorrow, and I hope you'll join us then. Until then, I leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, 
call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234. 